You're welcome. Well, we're here this afternoon with Dr. Quentin Schultz, who is a professor of communications at Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, who's written a large number of books and has been exceptionally thoughtful in the area of technology and the life of the individual believer and the worship life of the corporate community of the local church as well. And so, Dr. Schultz, thank you so much for being with us. We're very grateful that you're here on campus today to speak to a number of different groups. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, if I may jump right into the interview, I'd like to ask you first, you've written a great deal about a theology of communications drawn from scripture and church tradition both. And what I'm curious about is what you might say Christians would learn from God's own practices of communication in Scripture, realizing, of course, we aren't the Lord and can't say, thus saith the Lord, but nevertheless, we're created in His image. And so I wonder how you would say we might image Him in terms of our communications with one another. I'm going to start on what might seem like the back end of that question in order to get at what I actually consider to be the most important. God knows us. He knows us inside out, left and right, up and down. And when Jesus, as the Son of God, walked on this earth and would communicate with people, Jesus knew where they were at completely, knew what was on their heart, on their mind, not just what they professed, okay? And it's that kind of intimacy of knowing the other that we need to strive for. Now that begins with a vertical dimension, which is getting connected with God so that vertically we begin to have more of a heart and mind fashioned after Jesus Christ, okay? Right. So that's the start. But then there's this horizontal dimension. So we say, what skills do we learn from the way God communicates? God the Creator, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. And here we have to say that because as God, these three persons know us intimately, and they always adapt the communication to the particular people that are being communicated with, we need to strive to do that. So when the scripture says, be slow to speak and quick to listen, I take that to mean not just don't put your foot in your mouth or say stupid things or whatever, though we do that, or write stupid things or email stupid things, but rather know, first of all, what you're talking about, and secondly, who you are talking with. Okay, So it's that knowledge of the other in our communication so that we can, in fact, communicate with them as distinct persons as well as knowing what we're talking about that I think is critically important to, as a beginning place. I mean, there's all kinds of skills in presentation and so forth. For example, Christ in particular was a storyteller. Right. And I think illustrative stories are the most engaging form of human communication there is. And so I'm always looking in my public communication, whether it's preaching or whether it's uh, a Sunday school or whether it's speaking to a Christian college or university or a general civic group, what are some stories that I have, preferably real-life stories from my life or others, that will illustrate these points? And I know even from my teaching, if I'm losing the audience, I want to bring them back, go back to a story, you know. And so the scripture overall is in the form of a narrative, from creation through fall, redemption, second coming and all. And then we have, of course, Christ using these parables so marvelously. I think we need to be parable users as well. Right, good. Um, as, as part of this, as part of communication with one another, you write in your books a good bit about listening to each other with what you call the whole person. Mm -hmm. Could you describe for our audience just a bit by <laughs> what you mean about that? For example, I'm a local pastor, and listening is a very important part of my work, especially, obviously, in counseling. Consequently, what does it mean to listen with the whole person? Let's assume for a second that I desire to listen, okay? That is problematic. In other words, our desires are askew. And we may desire not to listen, even though we're hearing. Okay, so we have to get our desire right. So if you as a pastor say, I really want to listen to this person, you have to desire that. All right, up front. Augustine, St. Augustine, one of the great writers on communication in, in the Christian history, uh, uh, emphasized that we have to have our desires right. And when our desires are askew, then everything else is. So let's just assume that. 
Now, where do I go from there? What do I listen with? That depends on how I think of myself. Do I think of myself as a whole person or a partial person? If I listen only to understand intellectually, I'm listening with my mind. If I also listen in a way that I can have compassion or empathize with you, I'm listening with my heart. That's another dimension of listening. And then, let's say, if I listen with my spirit, now this is more problematic because for us to understand the spirit, the Holy Spirit, and what the life of the spirit is, is very, very difficult. This is, in some respects, a mystery. The spirit sure. is simply there. But I, I think what listening with the spirit in mind means is giving full attention to the other with the expectation that God will speak to us as well. So that as I listen with my mind and with my heart, I come to have some sense of how I can serve you, how I can respond at some point, not right away to interrupt. Uh, and, and then, the, 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 so, so we're drawn in to want to respond in some way that's to the benefit of the person that we're listening to rather than to our own benefit. I think that's a gift of the Holy Spirit to be able to do that, just as God can empathize with us. Um, far more than we can empathize with ourselves or with others. Yeah. Now, when you speak of, of listening to a person, as I understand it, with the help of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. working through your spirit to hear that person, are those the times that we're able to listen to a person beyond the person's words? He or she may be saying X, but really means X plus one, or perhaps even Y, and you're saying it's the Holy Spirit who may give us the ability yes. to understand, to discern that. Absolutely, and I would say that that also influences the head and the heart part of it, so that we gain a, a new and deeper kind of intellectual ability as well by, with the help of the Spirit and the experience that we have in listening to others in our lives. The same thing with the heart, so that the Holy Spirit helps us in all three dimensions. But this spiritual dimension of listening and speaking and so on is, is so joyfully mysterious. I mean, you know this as a pastor. Yeah, Sometimes yeah. you preach, and somebody is blessed incredibly, even though they heard something different right. from what you intended. <laughs> yes, yes. And if you ever uh -huh. reflect on this a little more deeply, you begin to realize, wait a minute now, what they heard actually was better than what I had. It, absolutely. You know? <laughs> it's, it happens and, frequently. And, yeah, and yeah. It's, you say, what the Spirit was involved here. Now, that person was listening to you, and they may have heard something different. This does not mean that we ought not to try to be clear about what we're trying to communicate. It simply means that the Spirit can transcend our weaknesses as speakers and listeners. Now, one particular type of listening that you've, you've written about, particularly in your book, Here I Am, is listening to God, um, especially in the area of call, call to ministry. Can you set forth for our audience, I don't want to tip them off to the full nature of the book because I want them to buy it and read it, uh, but can you give us nevertheless, the, the audience who will watch this video, some idea of how it is that we listen to God truly to hear Him, truly to hear Him? I think there are dimensions of listening to God, and it, it begins more or less with listening to God as revealed in Scripture. Right. And so if we look at people in Scripture, in the Old and the New Testament, we say, how are they called? How did they hear God's claim on their life? How did they begin this journey to say, God, I'm yours? And in the Old Testament, the, the phrase that's used repeatedly is, here I am. Now, there's a New Testament version of that, if you think of the situation with Mary, Jesus' mother, where she simply says, okay, I'm yours. Whatever you want to have happen through me, let it happen. May it be to me May as it you be. have said. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, let your words come true through me. Let me be the medium, so to speak. So uh, this, is, this is how we begin. And, and sooner or later in life, whether directly through Scripture or someone preaching Scripture or talking with them about Scripture, people suddenly get a sense that maybe God has a claim on them. And at that point, they have to decide whether or not in listening to that claim, they're going to respond. And if they do, then they start a journey in response to that calling. And it's a lifelong journey of continuously listening to God and continuously praying, attending to what God is doing in their life, the needs around them, how to serve people, 
how to be a good neighbor in the sense of the Good Samaritan and so on. And so it's a journey. Calling is a journey to a relationship with the God who speaks. And though it may start in Scripture, then God begins using all kinds of different things because the heart is open and the mind is open. So somebody's in a conversation with somebody and they say, you know, you've, you've said something there that I never thought about. Maybe that's a gift that I do have and maybe I ought to pursue that or maybe I ought to take courses for that or whatever. And I don't want to say that you literally hear God, but rather that God's Spirit acts in such a way that we repeatedly open ourselves to these suggestions that God makes through others, through signposts. I, mean, I taught now for 30 years, and the stories that I hear from students about how they zigzagged in life in different occupations and careers based on the way the doors opened and closed and God seemed to speak, there's no rhyme or reason to it. And so I say to people when I speak on this publicly, just think of Abraham. He's listed in the book of Hebrews as one of the great the saints of old, the people who was really faithful, listened to God's call, said, here I am repeatedly. And then the writer of Hebrews says, he went ahead in faith, but he didn't know where he was going. And so that's what it is. We don't know what, mm -hmm. where we're going. Other than eternal life, heaven in the end, along the way, calling is a journey. It's not our occupation, not our profession, but it's a journey of faith. It's a relationship with God and a resulting kind of relationship with other people. I know that the Puritan John Owen wrote, wrote about trying to discern God's voice truly speaking to us as opposed to, for example, our own voices mm -hmm. speaking to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Do you have any comments concerning that particular issue? Of, because the society today, it's a, a lot of voices speaking right. to us, including our own. Right. How do we discern out of that cacophony that this is God's voice? Well, we can certainly compare what we're hearing with what's in Scripture. But that only takes us so far, because sometimes we're faced with immediate decisions. What do I do tomorrow about A, B, or C? None of which is explicit in Scripture. So I believe that the most important thing is for us to be in community with other believers and to be in conversation and prayer with other believers so that this discernment of the Spirit becomes a matter of the community, which is itself yoked to the Word of God, rather than just individual feelings or individual desires, because it's when we focus too much on ourselves as individuals and what we want, that we get into trouble. So I think good mentoring for people in professions, a good uh, spiritual direction for people who are developing their spiritual lives or in ministry, uh, in, in small community, this is very, very important. Now, one of the major areas, if not the major area, that you've written on in recent years is the use of technology both by the individual believer and then by the church and corporate worship as well. I want to address the first of those. In your book, The High Tech Heart, you, um, you say you don't want to, as it were, throw the baby out with the bathwater. You don't want to dismiss uh, the advent of all sorts of new technologies as unhelpful or unbiblical or unspiritual. But nevertheless, you call on Christians to be more thoughtful, in fact, substantially more thoughtful in our use of technology. Could you describe for the audience your basic theories, your basic thinking concerning the individual believer and his or her use of high technology? Sure. I, I mean, this is an incredible time to be talking about this topic because the technologies are developing more rapidly than we can possibly figure out how to use them well. It's, it's crazy. If someone ever told me that I would have to become an expert on a personal computer in order to be an effective teacher, I would have said, you're crazy. You know, or that computers would be networked together, or that you'd get audio and video online, or that we would have a cable TV system at home with 100 channels and satellite with 300. I mean, it, this is just exploding. And we, we're really lost in this mess. And uh, we, we need to get ourselves anchored into some basic ideas that are biblical that we can use to help, let's say, discern. This is a matter of discernment, discerning what's good and right and proper use and what's not of these technologies. And I think that uh, there are a number of dimensions to this, but just to review a couple of critical ones. One is that because we have limited time, we have to allocate time between the more high-tech pursuits and the low-tech or the high-touch so they don't get out of balance. So you find somebody that spends way too much time online or watching television or listening to the radio or playing DVDs or something or listening to iPod all the time 
And their relationships with people, person to person in the flesh, are suffering. You find husbands that don't really know what the needs of their wife are, you know? They're, they're lost in this. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. But they know all kinds of other stuff about golf or whatever is they watch on TV all the time or the news. So this kind of balance between high-tech and high-touch, critically important. The second is the area of what's appropriate for people. Notice I didn't say yes or no to particular kinds of content, but what's right. appropriate. So what's appropriate for a nine-year-old or a ten-year-old on TV or on the Internet might be very, very different from what's appropriate for a 30-year-old, okay? Especially in the area of films. And now that films are being delivered increasingly online so you can get them personally in your home, you don't even have to be embarrassed by going out and renting a DVD of something that you wouldn't want to get caught seeing. You're going to be able to deliver that directly into the home. See, privacy. Right. That's right. why the pornography thing pornography is so bad online. online. is the same thing. Right. Yeah. So there's a matter of what's appropriate. Even if something is good, is it appropriate for a given age or development level? Scripture has an interesting take on this by saying that what we ought to do is be careful for the weakest among us. You right. See? Even right. if something's good, somebody may have a weakness in that area. So stay away from it. So I don't think it's just a matter of young or old, but a matter of our ability as individuals and those around us to help us understand what's appropriate for us. And then there are moral issues, okay? And, and here it, it gets kind of complicated because we, we might have something that's artistically good or well-constructed, you know, a website or a, a film or music or whatever, but there's a moral component to it that's not right. And, and some Christians like to justify their, their use of various entertainment technologies in their lives, uh, saying, well, as long as it's well done, you know. And I don't think so. I think the moral issues trump the aesthetic or the, the beauty issues. Mm -hmm. And so we always have to have the moral up front. And uh, take the, I, you know what I really like on this is Philippians four, which gives kind of a list of things. Right. But really, whatever is true, whatever, whatever is true, is noble, right. Whatever is a good report. Right. Think on these things. Right. And there are really three areas there, as I see it. There's an ethical component. There's an area of truth, and then there's an area of beauty. And we should meet all three of those. But again, I would say only meet all three of those in our use of technology, if we also have balanced our technological and less technological relationships and time management well. Because sometimes we can have content that's really great, but too much time with it is not good for us. Now, I would take these same principles into our interpersonal communication online, whether it's a Facebook, MySpace kind of thing, mm -hmm. whether it's email or instant messaging. Are we being truthful? Yeah. Are, are we being ethical, moral? And, and are we crafting in a way that's beautiful, uh, rather than just slopping stuff together and throwing it out there? Now, that last one I know is most controversy of all. And some younger people will say to me, hey, it's just communication. And I don't need to learn to know how to write well, or if I'm putting videos online, to create them to look well. Uh, but I th the problem that I have with that is that the artistic quality of the messages that we send, whatever the medium, say to other people whether or not we follow a God who is a God of beauty and desires that we adorn the world with beauty. Right. And I think we do. So I would say to students, hey, try at least to be a better writer. When you're, even when you're doing instant messaging, it, it, see it as an art form as well as a form for truth-telling and to be moral. On the moral issue, let me just say one thing about these websites that people use to communicate. I think gossip is becoming an enormous moral dilemma online. So you have people with websites, personal websites, that are posting information about other people. They're basically gossiping. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're doing it without putting their name on there. They just have a first name or a pseudonym. And you don't even know who it's coming from. And they're putting private information about other people. Right. Or you find high schoolers or middle schoolers on late at night on instant messaging, going back and forth, passing gossip and so on. I, I really consider the, the morality of gossip to be a huge online issue. That's interesting. I, I think I hear you saying, for a believer, if I'm going to write, for example, some, is something as simple as an email to another person, 
It honors the Lord who does all things excellently himself. There you go. To punctuate it correctly, to spell all the words correctly, to use complete sentences, and so forth. Especially if it's a more formal request. If it's a, a real quick thing, an instant message from one to another, do you have the file, uh -huh. you know, mm -hmm. or come down to my office, right. or can I call you at 9 p.m. tonight? I wouldn't worry too much about that. But as soon as we get into the point of communicating a little more deeply, about things, I think then we need to be attendant, especially to the quality of the messaging that we're putting together. And I'm not trying to be elitist about right. this and say that it has to be a work of art and a novel that's publishable and all that <laughs> other stuff. Doesn't have to be Dickens. No, no it doesn't have to be. Uh, but it, it does, I think, it, it should reflect the fact that uh, God, through Jesus Christ, is the Lord of our aesthetic or artistic lives. Not good. just the moral and intellectual and so on. Good, good. Does, um, does the isolation that technology sometimes cause, or, or can, can be a result of the use of technology, does that concern you? By which I mean, for example, I may send an email to one of the other pastors on the staff of our church who is ten steps down the hall when it would be perhaps better to go and just ask the question face to face and and have some interpersonal time with that individual do, does do you see isolation more and more and does that concern you yes i would say there are two things here one is isolation where we don't get out in the flesh and interact with people i think god may makes us in order to have this kind of incarnate communication just as jesus came right. down as a person a body is a wonderful thing. Being able to hold someone's hand, to shake hands, to walk the beach together and all this. The stuff that happens where we're proximate, close to each other, is very, very important. And that's generally where we find that the relationships become the richest, mm -hmm. whether it's business rich or personal rich or whatever. So that, that's, that's one issue. But the other issue is using the right medium. Uh, the biblical term I like the best for this is to be fitting. You know, in some Christian traditions, or even part of the liturgy, we'll say, well, what's right and fitting uh, as they mm -hmm. move toward mm -hmm. the Lord's Supper. And the idea, the biblical idea of fit is that there's a right time and place for certain things. So it's not just that something is right or wrong, it's is it right or wrong now in this setting? And here I think when you have people firing other people by sending them an email rather than getting yes, together with them in yeah. person, you know, yeah. or you have people trying to carry on dating completely online for a year before they ever meet or whatever, you know, as if they really know each other from that. These are not fitting uses. Yes. Yes. Now, we've talked about the use of technology by believers individually. You've also written a good bit about the use of technology in corporate worship and your contention has been that the church has embraced technology in that respect perhaps too quickly, again, without thinking through the issues adequately. Could you address sure. what you, you've written there, which I, I think okay. is very important for the church? Well, thank you. I, I got concerned a number of years ago going around to different churches while I was on sabbatical. And my wife and I thought we'd just sample what's going on. And we went to churches and we discovered that people were putting PowerPoint in left and right and using it at different points in the worship and not using it very well or fittingly. And, and I got rather concerned about that. Somebody had actually asked me before that to write a book on using these presentational technologies in mm -hmm. worship. And I said, no, I don't know that there's a problem out there that I should address. But then when I went on sabbatical later that year and went around the different churches, I said, oh, man, this is out of control. And it's not yes or no to PowerPoint. Okay, it's what I call yes, but. So we can use it, yes, but we have to use it well for the purpose of whatever the communication is, in this case, worship. So my basic thesis is that what we ought to do is take the technology and adapt it for worship. Not take the technology and adapt worship for it. For the technology. For, for, for the sake of the technology. So uh, one of the ways that you can quickly get into trouble is just put in PowerPoint and start using it throughout the worship service, saying, oh, you got to have something up there. You know, this is, this is the answer. And pretty soon it's the tail that's wagging the dog of worship. And uh, you no longer have a corporate sense of worship. All you have a sense is consuming what's on that screen all the time. 
And so it's fitting it white. And what I write about in the little book I did on using it uh, fittingly is using the word wisely. So use it wisely. The right places in worship, well done, with the right kind of traditions. Look at your own tradition of worship and all, and out of what you come, and who's communicating with whom at a given time during worship, and make sure that if you're using a screen, it supports that communication. It doesn't interfere with it. Okay. Create noise. Let me, let me ask a more particular question, because the group that you're about to speak to here um, through the Henry Center will be a group that is comprised at least half, if not more, of local pastors who are preaching every Sunday. And so, if I might address the particular topic of the sermon at the main corporate worship service of the church each week, um, how have you seen technology used poorly and well in sermons in your experience? In terms of using it poorly, it's on all the time with a lot of content, changing frequently, so it's, it's like noise that's constantly diverting attention to the screen. It's used too much, okay? That's the number one downside of it. Pastors who use it moderately, they have a key verse, a key term that they're defining from the Hebrew or the Greek or something, or they have a, a particular example or illustration, in some cases even a movie clip or something that's going right. to illustrate something. Uh, so they use it in a measured way during the service. Those are the best. Now, there are, there are also some issues of location of the screen relative to where the congregation is and where the minister is and so forth that is very important. Uh, the best strategy is to have screens that are on the sides, even if it's just one side, separate from where the person is preaching enough so that when the person is preaching, the attention can be drawn to that word as it's delivered and when the screen comes on with something new people can look at it momentarily say okay I've got that it's up there if I need to look back on it but now I'm back on the person who's delivering the message and the same thing is in education too we built the new communication building and we put all the screens on the corners in the front of the room so that when you're teaching and you want to walk over toward the screen and call attention to it you can do that but then you can also walk to the other side and people follow you now this may seem crazy, but I have experimented in classrooms where I have had nothing but noise, you know, the static, the white noise on the TV set in a classroom. And people will keep their eye on that even though there's no content. They'll watch the they'll snow. Watch it. <laughs> they'll, they'll watch the snow on and off during the class looking or is something coming on, what's going on, whatever, instead of paying attention to me when I'm speaking. It's really wild. Hmm. That's very interesting. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, a particular focus in your studies, which is St. Augustine and uh, his lessons that we can learn from his practices of communication. And I wonder, again, not trying to spoil one of your books so that people <laughs> won't read it, but I do wonder if perhaps uh, since there will be a number of pastors and other communicators who watch this, you might be willing to share at least a couple of the uh, helpful things that you've practices that you've gleaned from Augustine's practices for communicators today. Augustine's understanding of human communication for Christians is rich. It's broad, it's deep, incredible stuff in there. He was a master communicator, then became a Christian, and said, how do I change my communication as a Christian now? from my desire all the way up to how I do it. He said, it's not that you are skilled or not. You should be skilled as a Christian, but it's how you do it and the motive that you have. And he wrote a lot about public speaking, including preaching. And, and his understanding was, which I absolutely love, is the motive that you have to go into this with is that your audience is your neighbor in the biblical sense of neighbor, person mm -hmm. in need. Mm -hmm. And the reason that God has given us this gift of speech is to love the audience as our neighbor. Now, in order to do that, we first of all have to know what a legitimate need is for our neighbor. So we have to be in vertical communication with God. Right. Okay, and, and so that God helps us become wiser and understanding about the real needs of human beings in this fallen, broken world. And then secondly, we need horizontal communication, listening, studying, of specific people 
so that we get to know them well enough that we can, in fact, meet their needs through this gift of communication. Mm -hmm. So he was not the kind of person that said, you just deliver the word, you just get up there and preach it, apart from where the audience is at. You have to make some judgments in the case of a church with the congregation. What's going on in this congregation? What seem to be their anxieties? So that a sermon on the same topic, let's say fear not, might be a little different today in its examples and illustrations and all in North American consumer-oriented culture where people have a lot of stuff but still feel a lot of anxiety than it would be in uh, Western Africa where somebody's preaching on it and the, the fears and anxieties that people have have to do with the political situation or scraping for food or whatever, you see. So he was very much attuned to particularizing the message by contextualizing it for a given group, a given place and time. And so I've learned increasingly that if I'm going to speak anywhere, I have to spend some time knowing those people. Even if it's talking to people who, who know people there, if it's a mm -hmm. church or another school or whatever, or looking at their website or whatever. And you're bound to get into trouble, Augustine would say, when you're quick to speak and slow to listen, because you don't know what you're talking about, you don't know who you're talking to, but you're jumping in there. And I think this is where a lot of preachers get into trouble, because they think they're communicating, they're connecting with their congregation. But in fact, they've got the word, they understand the word, they, let's assume they've interpreted the word correctly, but the way they talk about that word doesn't connect with people, you yeah, see, right. even though it's very true. Well, we, we um, thank you very much for your time, for giving us this interview, and really thank the Lord for your writing. He's given it to individual believers and to the church for his glory and for the blessing of his people. And we thank are grateful you. to you. I appreciate thank it. You it's so an much. honor. Okay. Thanks.